Well, thank you, and thank you for putting this on. Thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about one of my favorite topics, actually two of my favorite topics. Uh, I've been studying creativity. Um, for some reason, I got interested in creativity all the way back in high school. You know, I was really interested in how people create things and why some people are more likely to create than other people. Uh, just anything, you know, whether it's art or science or music. So all my career, I've been interested in creativity. Um, and that's what got me to Berkeley. They had a long history of, of studying creative personality. But I've always been intrigued by this question of mental health and creativity, too, even though I'm not a clinical psychologist. And I don't even play one on TV, but, uh, but I, I'm a personality psychologist by training. So there's some overlap there. Um, so I'll go ahead and use this. So one of the things that, that this talk is going to be about is, is that question. Is, is there, and this is an age-old question, as it turns out, is there a connection between creative genius and mental illness, you know, or, or the way it was couched thousands of years ago by, as we'll see in a second, uh, madness? Uh, so here are some classic, extremely influential creative geniuses throughout Western, the Western world, for sure. But from Shakespeare, you know, so I kind of couch these, you know, here's literature, um, and then, well, da Vinci was everything, uh, and then science, uh, Newton, Einstein, and Curie, and then we have music, you know, Bach and Beethoven, and then we have, you know, these are just prototypes, exemplars, obviously, of, of and these people all change the world, of course, so this is a very, very high bar, for sure, um, but that's really the question, then, is, is, well, you look at those, I mean, how many of them were, well, Newton apparently had some issues, uh, personality-wise, and a few others, but, but you know, not all of them were. were uh, but Aristotle, way back, or maybe Seneca, but uh, we're going to say Aristotle since we know Aristotle better than Seneca. But uh, this was really the first time this observation was in the literature, and that is, there's no great genius without some touch of, of madness, is, is, was the idea. So, you know, that's his own observations are probably, like a lot of times, you know, there's got to be something to it. He didn't just create it out of nothing. Um, and then we're going to jump ahead to the uh, 20th century. Frank Barron, uh, a big, big creativity researcher, actually from uh, Berkeley at the time, um, said this. And this is actually one of my favorite quotes, because I think this really touches on something important here. He says, thus the creative genius may be at once naive and knowledgeable, being at home equally to primitive symbolism and to rigorous logic, he's both more primitive and more cultured, more destructive and more constructive. And then this is the, the key uh, for me, occasionally crazier and yet adamantly saner, I love that phrase, uh, than the average person. Uh, because what that really touches on is it's not a simple linear causal connection. There's a more complex uh, connection. Uh, they can both go into their deeper, darker, you know, nether worlds of consciousness and, and ideas and, and maybe even mood swings and disorders and other things, but then they come out of it. The creative genius comes out of it, maybe even uses that as fodder for their creative expression. We'll talk about that a little bit later, too. Uh, and then another current uh, creativity person um, in the field, Dean Simonton at UC Davis, um, says this, few creative individuals can be considered truly mentally ill. Indeed, outright disorder usually inhibits rather than helps creative expression. Furthermore, a large portion of creators exhibit no symptoms, at least not to any measurable degree. And I think that's another key, you know, insider point, and that is that it's that clearly if you're really seriously uh, disordered, you know, it's dysfunctional. That's, what the, that's the main criterion in the DSM for disorders, is dysfunction, okay? Um, so what seems to be going on to some extent by these observations and, and some of the literature suggests is that there's, there's, a, there's a sweet spot. You know, a little bit of madness uh, works okay and maybe even is facilitative, but too much is gonna, you know, if you're really seriously depressed, you don't wanna get out of bed and do anything you know, much less create something. So that's, that's another thing. Okay, so here's one thing that I like to do is, is I'm gonna, these are two quotes, uh, and I'm gonna, you know, uh, see if you can tell me which one was written by a, a creative genius and which one was written by a schizophrenic. Um, okay, here's the first one. 
They're also different. Boyle in talking about the shape of my foot, he noticed that once, even before he was introduced, when I was in the DBC with Poldy laughing and trying to listen, I was waggling my foot. We both ordered two teas and plain bread and butter, and I saw him looking with his two old maids of sisters. When I stood up and asked the girl where it was, what do I care with it dropping out of me, and that black clothes breeches he made me buy takes you half an hour to let down wetting all myself always with some brand new fad every other week. That's quote one. Got it? Makes sense? Perfect. I, it makes perfect sense to me. <clears throat> right. Okay, here's another one. Um, this creation in which we live began with the dominant nature as a, an identification body of a completed evolutionary strong material creation in a major body uh, resistance force and is fulfilling the nature identification in a like weaker material identification creation in which two major bodies have already fulfilled radio body balances and embodying a third material identification embodiment of both. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> okay, you tell me. Which one's written by a schizophrenic and which one's written by a creative genius? <laughs> really? Make, you have a 50-50 chance. <laughs> oh, the first one's a schizophrenic. Okay. Ah. Ah. You're too literate. <laughs> You're right. That's exactly right. Uh, the first one is James Joyce's Ulysses. And I read that as an undergrad. I should say I tried to read it as an undergraduate. <laughs> And I got to about this point in the book, it was about 100, page 135, and this had been going on for like 10 pages. You know, this stream of consciousness. Uh, no grammar, you know, just, you know, just running on of ideas, you know. Although, to be fair, if you sat down and did the same thing, if you actually wrote down what you were thinking for like five minutes, that's the kind of stuff that would show up, okay? It's kind of all over, it's not linear, it's not grammatical. You know, that's what our consciousness is. And, and, and James Joyce was actually, that book was voted by experts at the end of the last century as the most important work of English literature of the entire 20th century. And why? Because he did something actually influenced by Freud, for sure, he actually this is direct, of really portraying the unconscious mind uh, in literary form for really the first time. This had never been done in literature before. So it really was a major contribution. Now, you know, it's funny, years ago when I was at William & Mary and had some of these smart undergraduates, and I, I put this up there, and someone who was really well-versed in philosophy thought this was, uh, now you have to know philosophy to, to Hegel. Uh, if you've ever tried to read Hegel, and if this is what it's like. Uh, <laughs> now, this is a paranoid schizophrenic um, speaking in word salad. Okay, what's called word salad, uh, meaning the ideas on the surface, they kind of, it actually does seem very um, uh, almost educated. If you didn't know any better, you would maybe think, wow, this is a lot of, you know, this person's really, and maybe, actually maybe he is really smart. Uh, I think it was a he. Um, but it really doesn't make sense when you, although there are some current literary and, and social critic uh, 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 people who are writing not too different from this, and they're getting paid a lot of money uh, for it, but uh, that's a different story. Okay, so the point here is, is that how do we distinguish schizophrenia, for instance, from creativity? You know, they're both equally original. I think, I bet you've never seen either one of these sentences before, or even anything like them. Uh, so they're equally original. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but I, I, this was, just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, so a lot of people always say, when I ask audiences, you know, well, what makes something creative? Inevitably, everyone says originality, novelty, you know, doing things different, being unique, thinking outside the box, things like that. And I say, fine, yeah, that's great, yep, yep, yep. But look, sometimes different is not necessarily creative. Uh, you know, you can put your hair in a blender and cut it. That's really unique. That's really different. But it's really not all that creative. Okay, I think it's fair to say. Uh, just like the word salad of a schizophrenic is very unique, novel, and original, but it's not really creative. So what else do we need to make something creative? 
Um, any guesses before I put up my? Ah, okay. Value to society. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Say that again. Action implementation. So putting something into action. Okay. So being able to, to, to actually do something with it. Now, are you talking in an applied way? You know, like application. Yeah, okay. Uh, but, so like, like a, uh, a song would be an application, though, for instance, in, in a general sense, yeah, or a piece of artwork or something. Okay. Right. Um, so historically, uh, the way most creativity researchers define creativity is, yeah, so essentially, well, in fact, I should say that, that a lot of times people historically have said novelty, originality, uniqueness, and so on, and then useful or adaptive. I've now started to think of it better as more along the lines that you're suggesting, which is meaningful. It has to be meaningful to other people. Now, um, I mean, so if we got meaning out of that schizophrenic word salad, it, okay, maybe, and maybe we could say, but, but most of us probably don't, other than we're trying to understand the inner workings of a person suffering from schizophrenia. So we really do need both of these criteria, and this also puts creativity ultimately in a social context, that it needs to have some kind of meaning to people outside of the creator in, in this sense, you know. It's the classic, if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it. You know, someone, you can make an argument, someone could be extremely creative, but if they don't ever do anything with it, if they don't express it, that other people can appreciate one way or the other, we just don't know whether they, you know, they could have solved, you know, world hunger in their heads, uh, but if they don't tell us or express it in some form, we'll, we'll, we won't be able to evaluate it uh, as creative or not. Okay, so, uh, and then, yeah, so that's, the other thing is that, well, that's kind of, okay, that's creativity. What about the other side of the equation? What about uh, psychological disorders? This is more or less straight from the DSM. Uh, uh, you know, the three criteria that we also teach in intro psych. Um, you know, it, the behavior and thought needs to be deviant, needs to be different, uh, or it's just another way of saying uh, original. Um, deviant in a, in a statistical sense, not in a, not in a pejorative sense. Um, Dysfunctional, okay, so that's the, to me, that's really kind of the essence of a psychological disorder, that it has to interfere with everyday functioning. Usually social relationships are, are, are disrupted uh, and dysfunctional uh, and or uh, professional uh, things. So it's work and love, to, to paraphrase Freud. Um, and then it's distressing. It has to be distressing either to the person themselves uh, or to other people. Uh, and, and so those are really the, the, the three things that make something a, a, a psychological disorder. And again, I, f I focus mostly on the dysfunctional part. Okay, so speaking of that, uh, I was shocked when I first uh, uh, came across this statistic. Um, it's now uh, published 10 years ago or so. But if you look at the rate of, of mental illness, at, you know, so what this is is the lifetime rate. So meaning that what What's the probability that any one of us, basically, let's personalize it a little bit, um, will suffer a disorder, a psychological disorder, at some point in our adult life, and it's shockingly high. It's almost half of us. Uh, now, this can be mild disorders, could be major disorders. It includes all kinds of things, including like you know alcoholism and, and uh, chemical dependency and, and anxiety disorders and personality disorders and, and the major you know schizophrenia, things like that. But but if you put all those together, it's it's a whopping forty six percent. This is a U.S. statistic, I, and I think worldwide though I've seen other statistics where it's not too too different, like in Europe and other uh, countries. So the reason I put this up here is that we need a baseline. If we're going to ask the question, is creativity related to mental illness, we need to know what the rate of mental illness is in the general population and see whether then highly creative people uh, are more, have a rate higher than 46%, basically, is what it comes down to. That's, their, that's our com major comparison uh, group. Okay. Uh, so a little bit of background to the study that I'm going to briefly talk about that I've and some of my graduate students and undergraduates have undertaken 
we were influenced by this guy, uh, Arnold Ludwig, way back in the 90s. He wrote a book called The Price of Greatness. Uh, and as you can imagine, the, the idea is that he was looking at, he actually did a, a, a biographical analysis. He took over a thousand famous people who had biographies written about them, and they had to be reviewed in the New York Times uh, book review. And um, over a thousand in 18 different professions, and we've now, I've now summarized these in five different professions, natural science, social science. So these are physicists and chemists and so on. These are psychologists, anthropologists, sociologists, economists, poets, architects, and then artists. And then artists include performing arts, uh, like acting, as well as music, music composition, uh, music performance, uh, as well as visual art. Okay, um, And so what you can see here, so we have the baseline, 46%. And it's pretty clear that if you're a world-class creative poet, uh, the odds of you suffering some kind of mental illness is pretty high, 87%. Uh, not quite 100%, so there's 13% of them were fine, uh, but that's a pretty high rate. Um, artist, including actors and musicians and so on, also pretty elevated, it looks like, 73%. Uh, architects, uh, right around the norm, S social scientists, us, psychologists, uh, these are uh, also around the norm. Ah, but look at this. The physicists, chemists, and geologists, and astronomers, and other kinds of people are actually seem to be do, doing better than the, the general population. <laughs> are they, yeah, we're gonna come back to that. That's actually really interesting. Uh, they weasel their way out of it. Um, okay, so, yeah, because we're all suffering. Uh, okay, um, so this this was in this was my the main impetus for my study. I wanted to basically replicate this study, but with a newer modern sample. Um, so our basic predictions were based on Ludwig and other people that it's not so much m madness across in, in 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 creativity in any area of creativity, um, but it's probably more associated with artistic creativity. Uh, than other forms of creativity is essentially what we're what we're arguing, um, especially when you compare it to scientists or the general population, uh, and so on. Uh, and then, um, so what I'm really interested I'm really interested. People, you know, one of the things I'm always amazed by is when people talk about creativity, they often just assume that we're talking only about artists, like only artists are creative. It's like who said that? You know, have you ever tried to do science and solve? And important problem, it takes tons of creativity uh, to, to be really good at that. And, and, and business and life in general, I mean, you know, requires creativity. So there, you can be creative in any domain, uh, not just art. Uh, so anyway, but I'm really interested in the comparison between artists and, and scientists, since I think it's fair to say those are two of the major categories of profession that we can look at creativity. Um, so what we did, we did again something similar, but using a different sample obviously, is we did also a biographical analysis of famous people, by definition famous because they had biographies written about them. You know, you don't, most people don't have biographies written about them. Uh, and if you're an artist or a writer or a musician or a painter or a scientist and so on, you have to be pretty, pretty well established and, and doing some work that's, that's really acknowledged as, as having an impact. Uh, as meaningful uh, and original, so creative. Uh, so anyway, so our sample, we had criteria, okay, so they had to uh, be um, alive up through 1950 or later, uh, and then they also had to be born before 1980. So we had a, uh, so, so some, most of these people are, are dead, but not all of them. There's a few people who are still alive. Um, and then they had to have at least one biography written about them. And we had to look at only, there are some biographies out there that are written about the person's work. Uh, we couldn't use that because we need personal biographies, talk about their personality. And so we wanted to also get this in e-form uh, so we could digitize and do some analyses uh, with a computer. Uh, now as it turns out, a lot of these books that we ended up finding weren't in e-form, so we bought them, usually a used copy, and, and we cut the, this is kind of interesting as a, as a scholar and, 
you know, we actually cut the, the binding off the books and scanned them ourselves. So we, 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 had to, we had to buy a guillotine, a book guillotine, as my students like to say. We, we, we decapitated these books, but we, but we saved them. We, we digitized them. We, we, we're not going to sell them uh, or anything like that, but we're get, we're gonna, we need to analyze them, uh, and we did. Uh, so who was on our sample? Well, we had to, you know, we're not experts in every area. We can't say who the most creative people are, so we had to go to list. We had to go to list um, like encyclopedias and biographies and dictionaries, uh, things like the New Dictionary of Scientific Biography, the Britanni Britannica Biography of Scientists, the Artifacts Top 1,000 1, Visual Artists, Nobel Laureates, uh, novel 100 ranking of the greatest novels of all time, uh, Pulitzer Prize winners, and so there were actually other versions of this. This is just some of them. But we, so we had to get you know rankings by other people. Um, and then um, what we ended up, when we did that, we had 766 artists, scientists. Oh, one thing I should say is we decided, instead of just comparing it to the, to the population, we also wanted to have a comparison group of equally famous people, but who aren't creative. Now, we can get into a debate about this later. Uh, but I'm going to argue that athletes are not creative. OK, they're really talented. They're extremely gifted. But by our definition, they're not really creative. We can talk about the coaches maybe who come up with new strategies and plans that, that might be creative, but the, but the athletes themselves, with maybe one or two exceptions, aren't really creating. They're just extremely gifted physically. Uh, anyway, so, but we wanted someone who was, who was equally famous and had biographies written about them to, as a real comparison. Um, unfortunately, as you'll see here in a minute, uh, we're, not, we're still collecting data, actually. So we don't have as many in our control group as we would like. So we had 391 people who didn't have biographies written about them. Even though you're in this ranking of really important artists or musicians or scientists or whatever, you don't, doesn't mean you have a biography written about you. And sure enough, about half of them didn't. Um, so we ended up with 375 potential participants. We currently are in the... Uh, you know, if I'm going to do all of these, which would probably take another five years, but we'll see. Um, 188 uh, we've purchased. Um, we have about 180 of them in ebook format. Um, we've currently, and this is what our data is based on today, is is um, we have 161 that we fully have rated, um, and we'll see here in a second. So that breaks down into about half of those. Right at half of them are art, the artist. Um, and you'll see here, and we'll talk about that too, because um, it's always an interesting and, and it is an, uh, an issue. Um, but 21% are women. So these are visual artists, fiction writers, um, poets, actors, uh, musical performers, uh, music composition uh, people. Uh, so a lot of jazz and rock musicians were in this sample, actually, um, as well as actors, uh, current actors even. Uh, scientists, about 60 of them, uh, and only four. And we'll, that's another in, interesting sociological uh, uh, bias, clearly. Uh, although we can, we can, we can, we are going to up that a little bit. But only seven percent of them were, were women. Uh, these are people in technology, computer science, mathematics, physics, chemistry. Um, so kind of the STEM sciences, earth science, and then the biological life sciences, biology, medical science, genetics. Um, and then we had the social sciences, psychology, sociology, anthropology, and paleoanthropology. Um, and then, again, we're, we're, we're low on our athletes, but, but um, and notice, we actually do have a few tennis uh, stars who are women. Uh, we haven't coded them yet, though, but, but we're, but, but these are mostly male sports, although basketball now has, uh, a, a, you know, a professional, uh, but talking about baseball, basketball, football, and then, the individual sports like golf and tennis, and another team, soccer. Okay, uh, there just aren't many biographies written yet of, of, although I shouldn't say that. I was going to say someone who's in our study, a famous soccer player, was in our swimmers. Don't see too many. Uh, it's a few biographies, and then boxers. Okay, um, so what did we do? We did again. We digitized all these biographies, and um, and then we had a computer program select any paragraph that had any one of 125 keywords in it. So that immediately knocked down, you know, because books are really long, typically. Uh, and 
we don't need to read the whole thing. We just want the, 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 the gist of it where they're describing the person's personality. Um, so we first had this computer look for these kinds of keywords, although one of the things that's interesting, depression, as it turns out, especially in this sample, half the time meant the time period, uh, the, de the depression. Uh, so we had, to, we had to then, you know, as you'll see, well, let me, we had to then go through and have people, actual humans, uh, <laughs> uh, select those paragraphs from that subset uh, and make sure that we only were rating those paragraphs in which those keywords were describing the creator in question. If they were describing their family members or a friend or a spouse or something like that, obviously we weren't interested in that either. Uh, we really needed to have uh, it be describing the person in question. Uh, so we had to have humans go through and do that. And then, so then we finally end up with some subset, anywhere from a couple of paragraphs per book to dozens and dozens of paragraphs per book where the person's personality is actually being described. Uh, and then those paragraphs were rated um, by one of seven trained raters who were blind to the creator's identity. They were redacted, so it just said creator. Didn't say the person's name. So that's one nice thing about the program. We could just do that very easily. Just plug in creator rather than name. Um, so who were these people? When, when were they born? Uh, as you can see here, the vast majority of people were born in the first 20 years of the 20th century, from 1900 to 19, or actually 30 years, uh, to 1930 or 29. Um, there were a few people born before uh, the, the 20th century, uh, but they had to live. They had to live, uh, like those people, there was two people, uh, I think it was, uh, in the 1870s, but they had to live all the way to 1950. Uh, so they were old, uh, you know, uh, and there were. There were some people who lived to be over 100. Um, anyway, but, but yeah, so the majority of these people were, were um, born around the, the turn of the last century, basically. Um, here are the rating categories. If you're familiar with the DSM, you know that there's hundreds of diagnostic categories. We're not rating every one of them. We're just picking the big ones. Uh, and these were what we chose, partly because also Ludwig did similar ones, adjustment disorder, alcoholism, drug abuse, depression, bipolar, anxiety, OCD, schizophrenia, autism, spectrum, uh, suicide, sleep disorder, eating disorder, synesthesia. I, that's just, that's not really a disorder, but I like, I, I like this. Do any of you know what synesthesia is? What, what's synesthesia? Multiple, so yeah, the sensory, sensory experiences get, in a sense, kind of cross-wired. So you smell a color, or you see number as color, or whatever. So, and it's really interesting. And people who have this, uh, um, sometimes they're actually creative, you know. Actually, you could argue that, that hallucinogens create synesthetic experiences, where you see, you see the music. You know, instead of just hear it, you actually see it and color and so on and so forth. So that's a synesthetic experience. Um, personality disorders, and that's a whole hodgepodge of, you know, narcissism, you know, schizotypal, schizoid, uh, paranoid, uh, borderline uh, personality disorders, so a lot of those things. Gambling disorder, conduct disorder, kleptomania, and PTSD, post-traumatic stress. Um, so our raters had to rate these uh, paragraphs on a three-point scale. Uh, if, if it's absent, it's pretty clear. Just leave it zero. Um, if it might be there, uh, we can code it a one. Uh, and if it's pretty clearly there, uh, we code it a two. And then we had to have, we won't get into, uh, I had a postdoc working with me from the Czech Republic who did a lot of the details. And he found this new, really pretty cool and much more appropriate uh, reliability uh, which I had never heard of, and don't ask me to explain the math behind it. Um, but it actually, it's, it's better for when there's, it, it counts zeros, because uh, a zero is a legitimate evaluation. It means we're agreeing that there really didn't exist. So anyway, it's called GWET AC1. Uh, look it up, Google it. Uh, you know, uh, and so we had to have standard reliabilities before people started coding these books of 0.8 or higher. Um, Ah, so here's basically what we found. Um, 
Okay, so here's our, and I'm, I'm obviously grouping people into these t three major categories of art, science, and sport. Um, so, kind of replicating uh, Ludwig's basic finding. In fact, ours is even a little bit more pessimistic because uh, these are all the artists. And it was, remember, it was the, uh, it was the poets who were really up there. But we're, this is, this is, these are actors, musicians, uh, writers. Um, you know, 86% of them had at least one disorder uh, over the course of their life. Um, but then, uh, looking at the scientists, and this is lumping all the scientists and the technologists, you know, so people like in uh, the tech industry, creators of new technologies and so on are also in our sample. So 61%, and then, and this is actually interesting, and that's what's nice to have uh, this comparison group is famous people in this case, but who aren't creative, are also seem to be a little bit elevated compared to the base rate of 46% in the population. Um, so there is something maybe about fame, um, but it's not just fame per se, there's also, because if it were just fame, uh, these people would be around 60% too, and they're not, they're a little higher. So there's some kind of interaction between fame, notoriety, and creativity. Um, I think it's fair to say from, from this initial conclusion. Okay. Um, and then just to get a little bit deeper sense of what are the major disorders that we're finding in, in these. It's not all the, we only coded 19 different disorders, um, but the most, this is pretty amazing. Look at that for a second. Well over 50% of the artists in my sample suffered depression. Uh, and what's equally shocking, and maybe in some ways even more shocking, is that over 40% of the scientists did. So they're not scot-free uh, here either. But it's depression. And then just as a compare, point of comparison, notice that it's about 10% in the athletes. By the way, the base rate, this, this one I do know, the base rate in the general population for depression is right at 10%. Okay, so the athletes were no more, diff, no more likely or less likely than the general population, but the creative scientists and the creative artists were more likely to suffer depression than the general population. Um, anxiety also. Um, Again, uh, I don't actually know what the base rate of, ang uh, these are all the anxiety disorders uh, lumped together. Uh, I don't, so I don't know what the overall population base rate is, but uh, I'm sure it's not 33% uh, the way it was in the artist. Um, and notice it's about 18% for the scientist and right around 9% again for the, the athletes. Alcoholism. Uh, I'm, uh, I don't know what the base rate for alcoholism, does anyone know? Anyone have any? I, I, my hunch is that it's probably higher. It's the only one probably higher than depression. Uh, it's probably more than 10% of the population who would, at some not to say they're always alcoholic, by the way, and that's an important point. We're not talking about always. We're just talking about at some point that you'd be clinically diagnosed as being alcoholic or being depressed or having an anxiety disorder or whatever. Um, so, anyway, so uh, thir over 30% of the artists. Um, uh, only about 7% of the scientists and about, again, 9%, good old 9% for the, the athletes. Um, drug abuse, more common in the artist. Uh, in fact, again, remember that this does include musicians, uh, which is an occupational hazard. Uh, you know, drug, you get exposed to drugs and, uh, and, and alcohol for that matter. Um, but notice the scientists are, um, are less likely. Then, see, this is what I was thinking that might, maybe, you know, OCD could be almost uh, even beneficial or adaptive to, to certain areas of science, being really, you know, hyper-concerned with order and organization and, and having to have everything in its place. Well, as it turns out, um, the scientists were uh, not even higher than, than artists on that. Um, and I think here the base rate in the population is about uh, 1%. So there's a little bit, little bit elevated there. Notice there's no uh, athletes. That's zero for a reason. There were no athletes with OCD. Although, again, we only have 20 of them, so that might change. Ah, this was interesting. Look at suicide. Suicide is about 1% 1, 1 of the population, uh, maybe, maybe 
two percent depending on what time period you're looking at um, and notice that the artists who are really depressed but at least in our sample they're not killing themselves uh, you know they're actually in fact they're killing themselves at half the rate of the scientists and technologists which is that to me that was a that's a surprising finding um, you know uh, we'll look more into that and then the other one that I was kind of expecting to be higher among the scientists would be high-functioning autism, um, you know. Uh, and we do see some of that, um, and it is elevated compared to the base rate, which is now, you know, creeping up to like, what, 4% of the population, something around there. Uh, so we see a little bit more than that in the uh, scientist and about that in the artist and none of the athletes. Would have been diagnosed, and I think that's going to hold uh, even after uh, we get more athletes. Okay, so what is all this? What's our general conclusion here? Um, well, just like Ludwig, we do in fact have um, more uh, mental illness uh, incidences of mental illness in creative artists, world-class creative artists, than than world-class creative scientists or world-class athletes. I think it's fair to say. And more specifically, uh, our artists uh, are suffering from depression, anxiety, drug abuse, and alcoholism uh, at higher rates um, than our scientists or our athletes. But what's interesting is that if you compare uh, the depression, uh, you're seeing elevated rates of that. And that surprised me, by the way. I would not have predicted that finding, having worked with creative scientists myself. and, and uh, that, but. According to this sample, they're, they're definitely above baseline um, for depression. Okay, so let me ask you. I'll give my hunches in a minute, but I always like to ask my, my audience. Why do you think this connection... So let me back up. Okay, so this question of mental illness and creativity has a, both a yes and a no answer. It seems to be present mostly in the creative arts, Less so in the creative sciences, uh, and it's not, it's not again without, you know, existence in the sciences, but it's less than the arts. Uh, so why? Why are why are creative artists more likely to be vulnerable to psychological disorder uh, than creative scientists? Any speculations? Yeah. Well, I believe within a society, it's more the sciences are concentrated more, especially within our school systems. The arts aren't funded as much. You don't have much of a social belonging with that. So I believe that that is also like a possible explanation. But also, there's within, like, as a professional, um, artists don't, like, visual artists is what I'm kind of basing mm -hmm. off of. Visual artists don't make as much money as, say, like, um, a scientist or something along those lines. Okay. Yeah, fair enough, except let me point out that these are world-class people. So these people aren't poor, even the artists. Typically, you're right. Actually, artists, my son's an actor. I, I, I dread him trying to make a living uh, in acting, um, even though he's really good. Uh, but there's a million and one really good actors out there, um, and they're not making a living. So, but I say follow your heart, go for it, and be poor. You know, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but but in this particular case, though, these are not starving artists. These are people who are actually making a living at it. Uh, I, just to point that out, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. As somebody who's a double major in art and psychology, uh -huh. this is really interesting. Also, she is. Uh -huh. so it's a good combination. Uh, <coughs> I think that in general, artists are more attached to their emotions. Ah. Uh -huh. So artists are more in touch with their emotions, right? Right. So much of your art is just like extending your what you are feeling onto the canvas, right. or in a photograph, whatever it is. And or dance, or music, or or a painting. Uh, you're expressing your internal emotional. Like an extension of yourself. Right. So then, if people don't like it and they reject it, they're not rejecting your art; they're rejecting you. So Ouch. it hurts a lot more. No. Yeah. Not to say that scientists don't get really married to their, their ideas uh, and take it personally when they get rejected, because they do. Trust me, <laughs> I've seen it happen. But I think you're, but there is something more personal in t 
especially now, see, I would also make a distinction between social and physical science. I mean, the, the social science is a lot of us, you know, you've all heard the phrase in psychology, research is me-search. <laughs> okay, we study in psychology things that are personally important and relevant. In fact, that's one of the themes of our theory of personality book, that the personality theorists are influenced by their own personalities in what they, what they write and how they write and how they think about psychology. So, so yeah, so, but, but I think you're still right, though, that there's something, if you're a poet or a musician or a painter or whatever, and people are rejecting that, it's, it's a lot more you. Uh, that they're ultimately projected. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. Yeah. I think another piece of the puzzle may be that um, when you are writing or um, singing about your, so in the same kind of way, a lot of art is about personal pain and expression and those kinds of things. And there's sort of a remunerative effect when uh, you're repeating over and over, you're singing that same song about the person who dumped you over and over and <laughs> over and over and over again. There's more of kind of a repeated reflection on that that scientists don't necessarily do in the same okay, fair enough. way. Although you could argue, if you were Freudian, you might argue for the cathartic uh, value of that. Um, that it's so, but yeah, but but that's only if you're Freudian. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about the nature nurture kinds of ideas, and I'm just wondering if there may be something peculiar about the communities that these groups are a part of that may exacerbate whatever it huh. is. Such, Such as? as I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, that's the first step in research. Uh, Pardon? What's the family background? Uh, about yeah, I mean, one thing, I, I, we haven't done this analysis yet in our samples, but biographies, you know, we do have, and, and we are coding various uh, demographic uh, and socioeconomic and, and uh, parent uh, SES uh, kinds of uh, issues, but we haven't gotten there yet. But I, I do know uh, in, in other research that creative artists, uh, historically, you know, really famous creative artists are in fact more likely to have experienced some kind of like death of a parent at a young age, for instance, or other or divorce of parents. So have some kind of family turmoil uh, that artists are more likely to come from families like that than scientists are, for instance. So yeah, so but we just haven't analyzed that yet in our own our own data, but I think that's, and that might well be, I mean, when you think about the, again, you don't have, well, okay, let's just, you know, Freud's idea of sublimation, you know, that we're taking, that if we're a, a, an artist and we do have this personal issues that we're, you know, struggling with on some level, whatever the source may be, and we get, you know, motivated or driven to even do something constructive and creative with that suffering. Uh, Whereas art, I mean, scientists tend not to, to be driven so much by that. They're trying to figure out the world. Now, and, and that's what makes social science so interesting. We're trying to figure out the world of us, of people. But if I'm a physicist or a chemist or, you know, or, or a geologist, I'm trying to figure out the external world. Um, and that's, again, much less personal. But it's still, you know, uh, OK, yep. I'm too, if you did the person come that way and then get into the field, uh, or could the field have caused it? So like when you were talking about athletes, right. I immediately was thinking about CTE and the high profile yep, yep, yep. how those guys, who as a result of what they chose to do, suffered from an illness. Great, great point. Yeah, and that's again, yeah, that's also the kind of the classic $64,000 question, is the mental illness a cause or an effect? And I think in the sports, it's, it's pretty clearly more of an effect for reasons you're suggesting, and also access to, to money and drugs and alcohol that have taken down more than one uh, world-class athlete. Um, whereas in the arts, though, I think it might, you can make more of an argument that the, that the, the emotional state and the personality is a more of a cause. It exists prior to their world-class creative achievements. And then they're dealing with, I think, you know, so I think it, it's probably going to vary in, in the different professions. But that's, that's still, I mean, that's exactly the kind of question I would love to answer. Ideally, I would love to, to do a longitudinal study where you take young kids, follow them up for 30 or 40 years, 
uh, and see, you know, measure all kinds of psychological personality traits when they're young, keep measuring things as they go through adulthood, uh, and then see whether the, 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 the fame and the creative achievements that they make as adults are, again, yeah, cause or effect. Uh, but that's a great question. And needless to say, that's really hard to do. <laughs> you have to follow people for 30, 40 years. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder if the group that has biographies written about them had more adversity in their life. And uh, that's why they have a biography, because if nothing happened to you, there's nothing to write. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I can say, what I can say is that, that right, on, on that topic, it is more common. Biographies aren't equally written about famous people. And as it turns out, the scientists have fewer biographies written about them. And I would argue partly because, yeah, they're just not as interesting. I should say. Uh, yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's an interesting, and again, you know, and that brings up all kinds of issues too, of like, ideally we would have more than one biography even, uh, you know, because different biographies are going to maybe focus on slightly different things, and yeah, there, you know, like all good research, there's, it, it asks more questions than it answers, you know. And it's and there's no perfect, but that's a great suggestion. Yeah. I was thinking uh, someone who's aspiring to be a teacher might have reclusive tendencies. Okay. okay. So what, if you didn't hear in the back, uh, so what he's saying, suggesting is that that people who are let's say painters uh, might already have reclusive tendencies. By the way, I mean what I can say about that, I've done a little bit of research on this, uh, and there is a connection between introversion. And, and a desire to be alone and, and creativity. Um, that a lot of creative artists and writers and painters and musicians actually need time alone. Uh, in fact, if you're really extroverted, it's hard to, you know, if you're always socializing, you're not gonna be doing a whole lot of creating because you know, you're out there doing things with people and so on. But if you're a writer or a painter or a musician, you need that alone time. You need a room of your own. As it, as Quote, uh, paraphrase Virginia Woolf, um, and you and so and so right. So there is a connection between that personality trait and disposition and creativity. How about yeah. Neuroticism? Neuroticism? Neuroticism. Yeah, there actually is. Uh, a, there's so I'm writing a chapter right now on personality and creativity, and the Big Five. Uh, openness to experience is the major Big Five dimension connected to both creativity and art and science. Uh, but neuroticism is another one. Uh, more, a little bit more in the arts, apparently. Uh, then, so, so, you know, which is ultimately neuroticism is just the the non-pathological, you know, predisposition towards negative affect, negative emotion. But it's not pathological unless you're really, really high in it. Um, so, but yeah, there is some mild association there. Yeah. Yeah, schizophrenia, it's interesting. We, you know, what's amazing is that with the exception of John Nash, the famous John Nash, uh, the beautiful mind guy, if any of you have either seen the book or I've seen the book, seen the movie or read the book, well, you've seen the book, you know, too, I guess, it's fair. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, with that exception, I don't think any of the, my sample was, was uh, schizophrenic. Now, again, Mild, milder forms of it, uh, maybe. See, because that's the thing about schizophrenia is it's pretty debilitating once you're in it. And even John Nash, by the way, he was diagnosed, he went from kind of schizoid or schizotypal, maybe as a, as a younger adult, he didn't develop full-blown schizophrenia until he was 30, and he was going out for tenure. That's enough to make anyone, <coughs> <laughs> having gone through that. Uh, pretty stressful life event, and uh, yeah, that push, pushed him over the edge. And then he wasn't creative. I mean, that completely got rid of his own creativity. Uh, that, uh, the illness was, was pretty, but, but his, and so even the Nobel Prize Committee debil uh, d deliberated on that for quite a while. Should we give someone a Nobel Prize who's, who's schizophrenic? Because they didn't know how he would act, you know, in this very formal, I mean, that was literally part of the deliberations. They were thinking about, that. and this was like 35 years after. But he did that work when he was in his 20s before he suffered schizophrenia. Yeah. Uh, can you speak to the, the proportion of these biographies 
uh, that focused on kind of personal, uh, personal life events versus more kind of academic and athletic accomplishments. Because you would think that athletes and scientists, more of their biographies would be devoted to the oh. of the Yeah, that's an interesting, you know, so as I said in my, my method, Part, if, if there were some books that were exclusively professional, and we had to exclude those, obviously. But the, yeah, the vast majority of these are a combination of personal and professional. Um, but the proportion, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if the proportion of the, let's say, artistic biographies are more personal and the, compared to the scientists or the athletes. Um, we just haven't looked at that. Yeah. So he was writing about uh, more, more about an artist, uh, kind of personality, what led them to, uh, to create this painting or sing the song. Yeah. So these words like anxious and depressed. Well, and so that's why we, but but you know, but but we make it very clear that just because you see those words doesn't mean we rate it. You know, er, like everyone, like this is actually a classic example. I tell my raters, just because someone gets drunk doesn't make them an alcoholic. You know, just because someone had a period of anxiety doesn't make them suffering from anxiety disorders. So you have to really read the whole book, all the paragraphs, and make an evaluation only after you've read all of them and make sure that it's persistent or it's more than just a single isolated incident. Yeah, so uh, it's more, more probable, right? So your right. one or two would be improbable rather than present. Well, it, de it depends. It depends, right. It depends on how clear it was. Uh, if we only have like yeah a little bit of evidence for it, and we're not then that's when we call it probable. But if it's pretty clear, if it's persistent, um, then we call it uh, you know present. Yeah. How, how, how would you say that persons at the high level have to maintain that high the high level of you know of, uh, information, if you will? How would that balance out with the need to uh, have uh, society stimulus? You know how society would. Well, I mean that's right, right. I mean that's that's definitely I think more of a challenge for artists often than it is for scientists because in science, again, you know, you know, although ideas are different, but but in terms of research findings and discoveries, you know, again, any any good study asks as many questions as it answers or raises as many questions, so you kind of know where to go. Although what I've discovered in my own research with scientists is that the good ones will say things like, you know, every X number of years, I just change topics, just because I get tired of doing the same thing. And I'm just, I don't want to do just little minor variations. I want to completely change my thinking. So I'll just change questions completely. Uh, and it takes a lot of skill to, and confidence to do that. Now in art, However, in terms of the, the, the need to maintain that, I mean, you see that in, in artists, and especially musicians. I mean, I, I, I follow enough music to know that one of the big issues for a, a, a musical, both performer and, well, ultimately performers, is you don't want to just, you don't want to necessarily do what the fans want that's made them happy in the past, but on the other hand, you don't want to ignore that. Because if you go too far and, and create too different of a music form, you're going to lose a lot of your fans. So how do you maintain that uh, high level creativity uh, doing different things compared to yourself? So yeah, I think that is an issue in, in art. Um, and maybe one reason why it's so, you get people who are one hit wonders and, and then end up you know, maybe going, going down emotionally because of the lack of recognition and fame and, and you know, and reinforcement ultimately. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think, because I was just thinking about this, like the stereotypes, like artists are known to be more depressed. So if someone wants to be an artist, they may kind of focus on some of their depression feelings because of the stereotype that artists are depressed. Yeah, yeah it's hard to say how much, I mean, stereotypes, you know, how much people decide on careers. Uh, Although ultimately career choice is actually very interesting and personality and career choice is a big deal. Whatever the, whatever the career and whatever the personality trait, you know, in fact, it's not uncommon for universities and colleges to use the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs type indicator in career counseling. Uh, now we have issues with the MBTI, uh, you know, for reliability and other reasons, but, but there's absolutely no doubt, there's tons of evidence uh, 
that personality plays a big role in career choice. Um, now, whether it fits a stereotype, yeah, I mean, that, that may, I, I can't discount that, uh, and it makes sense, um, but I think you're just trying to find a match. I mean, if, you're, if you want to be a, just to pick a, an example, if you want to be a salesperson, and you're really, really introverted, and you don't like being around people, and you'd rather be alone, is that going to work? <laughs> no, I mean, you, you know, you need a certain personality uh, to, to sell things, for instance, uh, or to do, you know, so I think people are, in fact, matching their personalities with their career choices. So, yeah, whether depression, people who are prone to depression say, well, okay, what career paths do I have? Uh, you know, art, music, the, the artist in torment. Um, yeah, I guess that, that's a stereotype, and, you know. But it does match your personality. Ah, a st stereotype threat. Yeah, there you go. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking about this idea of um, uh, that science uh, is sort of self-correcting over time, ah. and that the creative arts really aren't self-correcting. Right. In quite the same way. Well, not in the same way, right. I mean, the thing about science, right, science is cumulative and it is self correcting, um, sometimes despite itself, um, in a different way uh, than, than now. But okay, so let me push that a little further. So, what's the connection there with it? Uh, what are you thinking about the mental health, mental illness connection? Uh, I'm thinking about what these two young ladies said about artists. Um, and their personal uh, ah. uh, issues being put out there as, as the, 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 um, the um, picture of what they do, as opposed to science being, you know, the ideal is that as new information comes in, its theories are tested, it should correct itself. But that's hard to ask of individual artists, uh, ah. creative artists or, you know, your emotions aren't necessarily self-correcting because they're expressing right, that. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and that's what makes someone like uh, Picasso all the more amazing, that every, what, 10 years, he just completely changed format, you know, and form, uh, and just reinvented new, completely new forms of expression. And he was doing that into his 90s. But I think maybe associated with that is the idea that science <coughs> appears to be, at least on the surface, provide society with more utility. Ah, well, I, sure. Although, right, and so that's actually a conflict we're having in the school system, aren't we? Uh, we're not funding the arts as much uh, as the STEM sciences and, and so on. Yeah, that's one reason my kid goes to a school for the performing arts. Uh, they, they, they appreciate that. Uh, yeah, okay. Did you include any autobiographies, or were they all nope. the Nope, could not. Uh, as interesting as that would be, that would actually be a, a, almost a, actually that's an interesting study unto itself. But most of these people don't write autobiographies or memoirs. Um, but yeah, no, we had to exclude, exclude those, right? A little, little different perspective than when someone else is writing about your life, yeah. In that same vein, with the biographies you looked at, uh, authorized, unauthorized? Oh, yeah, every now and then that issue came up. Uh, his, the vast majority of them, that wasn't an issue, but some of the more current ones, there are some, especially like some of the actors, uh, they had authorized versus unauthorized, which is always interesting when you get into that. Um, for the most part, they were, I would think it's safe to say, the vast majority of them were authorized for whether, you know, what that means. Yeah, yeah. Um, you kind of mentioned fame as like a factor, mm -hmm. but personally, I would think because you said like athletes are the same amount of fame, but they're scored or lower. But I would think, I mean, I don't know, just me personally, I think that artists have more fame because I mean, I really don't know athletes, so they're not really um, famous to me because I don't know. Really well, like to you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I, let me just say, as a culture, I think it's fair to say that athletes are the are are, are more well known. For the most part, than than most scientists or artists. Yeah. Right. Can you further, like, why you didn't use them as a specific factor, like, 
Well, I mean, ultimately, that's that's why we did choose our our comparison group of athletes uh, to be to to kind of. You know, because you, ideally you want to hold everything constant except the thing that you're interested in. For me, it was is is uh, uh, creativity. Um, you know, but we needed that fame. We needed to exclude fame as an explanation by having a comparison group that's equally famous. Yeah. Um, if that answer, I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah. Um, I, I keep going back to Ah, uh, right. 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 Yeah. So the, if you didn't hear this, the her her observation is that in you know to be a, an athlete, you know, and, and we now have quite a bit of evidence that that uh, exercise, especially aerobic exercise, as it turns out, is a is a uh, buffer. Uh, it first of all, it you, you feel better physically. Uh, it actually is more associated now with neurogenesis uh, and other kind, you know, neural growth and other things. And so, yeah, there's no doubt that being physically fit is, is uh, and, and by the way, I, you're not going to see a really high rate in depression, for instance, among athletes. It's really, it's almost mutually exclusive. You can't be a world-class athlete and depressed. You can't be a world-class poet or writer, uh, maybe even scientist, uh, and be depressed. But you can't be a... Uh, an athlete. Uh, I'd be kind of curious to look at the performing artists, such as the musicians uh, and the actors, who may also be very physically fit. Right. I'd like to pull uh, that out and compare well, that individually. The real interesting uh, would be dancers. Right, right. 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 Equally right. athletic. So when actually. compared with the larger group of artists, are those who are athletically artists, uh, okay. are they lower? And that's what I would Yeah, about. interesting. Next study. Good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. What strikes me, high levels of depression among artists, low levels of suicide, my, my first is like, okay, why? My hypothesis is they're seeking treatment. Uh, they might be more prone to seek treatment, which may also be the higher levels as a culture of artists professionally. Right. It's more acceptable. Interesting. Okay. Socially. Yeah. To right. suffer from depression, you're not outcast. Where maybe among scientists and athletes, and they're less likely to seek treatment, and therefore like more likely to actually they're less likely to talk about it. To they're actually, more likely and, to be and, and then suffer, go all the way to suicide. Right, where the scientists have a higher ah, rate. They may just be in denial. Ah, that's, a, that's an interesting observation. I hadn't thought of that. I mean, I might steal that idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, Okay, I think we have, I mean, I don't know, we're about out of time, I think, but uh, one, one more question. I'm curious, uh, it could it be that uh, people who are depressed uh, just have an easier time being artists than scientists in, in the sense that uh, if I'm a scientist, that would be at work pretty often. I, I right. <laughs> but as a... Well, well that's, that's ultimately, yeah, that was one of my, my main speculations on this, is that in order to do science, you need to, you know, especially lab science. I mean, you know, although how many of these people are laboratory scientists versus, let's say, theoreticians? Some of them are theoretical physicists and so on, for instance. But, but in order to do that, yeah, you need it's it's a much structured lifestyle. Science is. I think that's pretty obvious and and uncontroversial thing to say. Um, uh, whereas, you know, an artist or a writer you know, can, can stop working for nine months or a year or whatever and not really completely impact their, their career as much as it would a scientist, you know, especially a laboratory scientist. So I think, so actually here's my basic, one of my speculations is, is that it may be, and this is where we get into the developmental question again, it may be that scientists start off with higher rates of mental illness, but if you then suffer mental illness, you don't become a scientist. You just can't. You can't. You're not going to get hired. Um, you know, because if you are suffering from some kind of mental illness, uh, that's going to be a a big red mark on your application, basically. You know, or or that you will just have. If you stop going to the lab for a few days, you'll be fired. Are there other kinds of things? Whereas in art and writing and so on, that doesn't happen. So I think there's a there's a there's a, a winnowing. Uh, 
almost by necessity of scientists who might be suffering from mental disorders. Not completely. I mean, we, you know, obviously it doesn't, this isn't 100 percent, but I think there's something to that. Yeah. Um, back to the suicide date. So the scientists have the higher rates of suicide, which I'm assuming is was either suicidal actually <coughs> here's, here's what we, more male, right? Yeah, oh, okay, good good observation, right. Men are more likely to commit suicide, uh, although I think the rates of suicidal, and by the way, what we did is if, if people had persistent thoughts of suicide, we gave them a one, and if they actually either attempted it or did do it, uh, it was a two. That's how we scored that. Uh, but you're right, that there is a gender difference there. Um, now. Oh, someone asked in my, one of my other talks yesterday about this is that, but on the other hand, along those lines, is that, you know, there's so few women in this, this sample, um, and yet depression was really, really high. And women are more likely to, to, to suffer depression than men. So if we had more women, it would be even higher, which is kind of scary. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted, I didn't, I, as always, I didn't do this alone, so I just wanted to make sure that my research assistants, uh, and then my, my postdoc, uh, 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 Daniel, he's from the Czech Republic. He came all the way from the Czech Republic to work, with, and we, we, we did this study, so this, or started it. He had to go back, so he's, but he's still, he's still working with me on this. So, okay, thank you.